And Father, just make me a nail upon the wall, fasten securely in its place, and then from this thing so common and so small, hang a bright picture of your face. Amen. All right, so I'm probably an unknown entity to a lot of you guys since I've come from Australia, so I'll give you a little bit of a background on me and where I am with uh, how I came into studying prophecy. I actually wasn't raised an Adventist. I was a typical Aussie uh, family upbringing, which is very deistic. Uh, like, God exists, but he's out there somewhere. And, you know, the, the, the only religion that I really knew about was uh, sports and barbecues was the altar, and that's, that's the sort of thing that we have in Australia as a typical. But I went to an Adventist school because my family wanted me to get a, a, a Christian um, well, more a private education, and so that, we, that was the one that we chose, and uh, it, I wasn't that interested for a long time at the high school until Net 98. Net 98 was basically the beginning, and that really, like, I went there because it was quite well advertised, and so watching Dwight Nelson go through the prophecies, all except Daniel 11, of course, uh, it got me really intrigued, and then... then I kind of backslid a little bit because my mum was like, but you've got to give up meat. So, okay, all right, I'll, I can't go, go there. But then Net99 came around and got reinforced again. Of course, still no Daniel 11. So I was really, as a student of history at high school, I really loved the prophecies, how they correlated with history. And this was a proof of the, the existence of God. This was, to me, the biggest proof of the existence of God was history in advance. So... I was interested in, the, but, but then there was this chapter that was never gone into, and I, I would ask the pastors, and they would go, oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's an interesting chapter, and that was about it, you know, a very politician answer, you know, oh, that's an interesting question, but I'm not going to answer it. So I started looking into it. My first actual engagement was coming across something, this was like early days of the internet, and it was a futuristic interpretation, you know, like the, the, the 1260, 1290, 1335 days of Daniel 12 are in the future. And so I looked at that and I'm like, oh yeah, maybe this is something really new. And then I was like, nah, okay, it doesn't really fit. So I just thought, okay, I'll leave it on the shelf. I'll, I'll, I don't know enough. Uh, I, I read Daniel and the Revelation by Uriah Smith and I thought, I'm going to default to that. And so there were three passages in prophecy that I basically did that for about... 12 to 15 years, I left them on the shelf and I was like, you know, if I get asked about this, I'm just going to refer to Uriah Smith uh, until I have the capacity to learn this more. Because I was 16 when I, I became an Adventist. And so I didn't, I didn't have the, the knowledge or the tools to get the knowledge at that time. And so those passages were Daniel 11, there was the trumpets, and there was Daniel, uh, sorry, and there was Revelation 17. Uh, so, you know, flash forward, I, I every now, every couple of years, I would kind of take it off the mental shelf. I'd be like, nah, I still don't have the, what it takes for this. So a few years uh, ago, I, I started to go through them and look at it from a hermeneutic perspective first, and then start to look at interpretation. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. I, I attend Kingscliff Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, D David Ashrick is uh, our pastor. So, you know, a um, hello from, from my, my church and my pastor and also from my wife who's in Armenia. Uh, hi, babe. She's watching. Okay, so uh, my paper, it, I'm not going to go directly through my paper. It's on the website. Uh, I'd encourage you to read it. I'm going to kind of synthesize. I'm going to cut out some of the peripheral aspects, some of the things that we can, you know, I'll probably raise to the panel during the rest of this conference, especially when it comes to Dr. Gaines' uh, hypothesis on the first half of the chapter. Uh, but I'm going to start, I'm going to prosecute a case. Before I became an Adventist, I was actually wanting to be a lawyer. And then I realized you can do just as much arguing in the church as you can in the court of law. So I thought that I would just, you know, Transition. It was a very easy transition. So I'm going to prosecute a case here, and my paper is The Broken Messiah, Prince of the Covenant, the Hermeneutical Doorway Between Type and Antitype in Prophetic History. So my opening statement, I, I want to kind of do a bit of a recap, and, and this is going to be an affirmation of all people who hold to a historicist point of view. I think, I think there is a difference in complete platform when it comes to the futurist, Adventist futurist point of view, but this will, this will embrace historicists. Uh, so, Daniel 11 in Adventism today, you know, there's a lot of early consensus that we can grasp onto. There's a general agreement uh, of, on the interpretation of the first 13 verses. We're, we're pretty much locked in. In fact, we, 
we are in agreement with Preterists on that. So that's how you know that you've got something pretty solid, is even if someone a completely different uh, background is, is agreeing with you, you yeah, there's a, there's a lot of consensus there. There's a functional agreement on Rome being introduced somewhere in verses, between verses 16 to 20, maybe even verse 15. Uh, so we know Rome's coming in there. That's something we all as historicists agree upon. Then there's a general agreement that the cross event is presented in verse 22. Uh, there are outliers for some of these things, but I'm talking just a general consensus. And there's a, a, an agreement on a literal fulfillment of the first half of the chapter. So that is, that is where we're, we actually get to the same point at the end of the chapter um, as well. I'd like to say that, you know, Michael's standing up. We all agree that Michael's standing up, that's Jesus and that's the judgment, that, that's the, the close of probation. So if you think about it, half the chapter is locked in. You know, we, we, can, we can rest assured that we, we know where we're starting from is the same point. That's actually a good thing, isn't it? Okay, but then there's two paths. There's two main paths. Like the, I know that there's different ways of categorizing, uh, uh, and I was talking to uh, Dr. Vine, and he was saying that he puts three different groups but then he, uh, of clusters of interpretation on Daniel 11, but then he found that even within those groups there's multiple strands. But I actually see it as two different paths. There's a geographical literal path, uh, which is where the kings of north and south continue to relate to powers to the north and south of Judea. Now, some might locate it specifically in Anatolia and Egypt. Uh, some might go, well, Babylon and Egypt. Others might say it's, it's just somewhere to the north, somewhere to the south. I know that um, Pastor Rosenberg seems to have the, that, more of that idea because that, he has uh, Islam coming from the south. So it's, it's just directional in some sense. The key hermeneutic principle is one of internal consistency. And this is something that Pastor Kier is, you know, from, from what everything that he said, I, I have to say that he set up really well the fact that the onus of proof is on anyone to uh, demonstrate something other than internal, like li literal, is, literal interpretation. He's basically right in that. There has to be good reason. A lot of the quotes that he put forward were without good reason, you know, unless there is good reason. That's what was coming through from these uh, Protestant and Millerite interpreters. D does everyone catch that? So there has to be a good reason uh, because internal consistency is a very good, and, and the key rule, and Pastor Kier brought this up, is Miller's 11th rule, how to know if a word is used figuratively, if it makes good sense as it stands and does no violence to the simple laws of nature, then it must be understood literally, if not figuratively. Okay, so that's the first path. The, the second path is what I call the representative spiritual. Now, you can use many different terms. I've just kind of put two tif different words together that kind of represent it. Uh, so this is that the kings of north and south, after the the half middle of the chapter refer to increasingly spiritual successes of the kings in the earlier parts of the chapter. Uh, the key hermeneutical principle here is intertextuality. Okay, that, that's the one that kind of uh, you see this first in the way that uh, James White looked at the chapter. Even though he had a, the literalism, he still looked at it from well. We've got to kind of overlay this with Daniel eight, Daniel seven, Daniel two, and. So intertextuality in this sense means comparing scripture with scripture outside of the, the chapter that we're dealing with. Um, this actually has a Miller, Millerite support in his sixth rule, which says that God has revealed things to come in, by visions, in figures, in parables, and in this way, the same things are oftentimes revealed again and again by different visions or in different figures and parables. If you wish to understand them, you must combine them all into one. What this means is you can't understand Daniel 2 uh, uh, in its totality without Daniel 7 and then without Daniel 8 and without Daniel 11 and, and backwards as well. You can't understand Daniel 11 without first understanding uh, the earlier ones. So there's two views that have two valid hermeneutical methods, don't they? You know, internal consistency and intertextuality are two very valid considerations when we come to exegesis uh, and hermeneutics. Uh, the difference is in priority, how they're prioritized. Okay, you can have two very important methods and then you can just go, okay, well, we're going to do this one first and then we'll do this one. Or we, you could switch it around and you might come up with something completely different. So uh, hermeneutic justification is needed. This is what the key point. K uh, Pastor Kier is correct that you know, literalism should be the default. 
because that's how we understand things. That's how things normally go. So unless there's a reason, a good reason, to have a switch, uh, it, it should be literal. So hermeneutic justification is needed for a pivot from literal to spiritual. I'm going to give you that. That's, that's going to be the case that I'm presenting. So exhibit A, a pattern of repeat and enlarge and apocalyptic. So the key points in review, Daniel's visions align with linguistic, stylistic, and thematic synchronisms. Historical details in one prophecy provide an anchor point in parallel prophecies. Now, does anyone know where in Daniel 7 that it says that the lion is Babylon? It doesn't. It doesn't. We, we, don't, we don't have an anchor point in Daniel 7. How do we know that the lion is Babylon? Because we can compare it with Daniel 2. We can see some, some uh, synchronisms. We can see the iron teeth match up with the iron in the, in the statue. We can see uh, other aspects of the, like the, the fact that there are four metals and four beasts. We can compare them and go, okay, well, these synchronisms help us to align and therefore have confidence in the prophecy, even though Daniel 7 doesn't have a clear interpretation uh, that gives you know, an anchor point. Daniel 8 is missing the first kingdom but of, of Babylon, but it realigns itself through both parallels in the, in the symbols and then the literal saying, oh, the, the ram, by the way, that's, that's Medo-Persia. That's the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. Now it's realigned. We've, got a, we, we've reset our synchronism here. So each new prophecy increases the number of details as well. So we start off with a very basic understanding. There is no broken prince of the Messiah in chapter 2. Jesus is, is the culmination, you know, the, the kingdom, the antitypical kingdom that's go, going to come. But he's not really hinted at as a broken Messiah. That doesn't come in until Daniel chapter 9, really. It's hinted at in chapter 8, but then it's revealed fully in chapter 9. So... Uh, earlier, clearer visions bring clarity to later opaque visions. This is a, this is a key interpretative point here. Uh, like a jigsaw puzzle, you first put the edges together, that's Daniel 2, then you, you fill in the details, and then the rest. And by the rest, I mean, you know, if you're doing a, 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 a jigsaw of the, which has a lot of sky, you don't do that first. You leave that until you've got, that's all that's left, I'll do the sky or the water or the things that are very uh, opaque, uh, and not a lot of detail to fit them together, not, no lines. So exhibit B, the hero, heroic protagonist of Daniel and history. So who is the main character of Daniel? A lot of people might think that it's Daniel because it's called the book of Daniel, right? Well, where is Daniel in chapter 3? He's not present. So he can't be the main character in his book if he's missing for a whole story. He's absent, you know? So... Uh, Daniel is not the main character of Daniel. If you're looking at it from a literary perspective, a, a narrative perspective, Daniel is more of a, a deuteragonist, not a protagonist. He's the second most important character, and he fills the, the role of an everyman in the story. He is the one who we identify with. We, we can identify with him, even though he's classed as in this... Like, we don't see him sin. We know that he has sinned because he's a sinner, all have sinned. But we see through his eyes, he's a person thrust into a, into a situation that he wasn't prepared for and has to deal with it. And so one of the uh, definitions of an everyman, the everyman character archetype, often acts as a stand-in for the audience. The character archetype is just a normal person, but for some reason, he or she must face extraordinary circumstances. That, that pretty much sums up Daniel, doesn't it? But, you know, who is the hero? The hero of Daniel is the antitypical Cyrus. In Daniel chapter 1, there is no Cyrus, but Cyrus is mentioned, he's hinted at, because there is an antitypical Cyrus. The, the first time Cyrus is mentioned in the Bible is in Isaiah, in the context of um, the, the servant, the servant character. We know there was a literal Cyrus, but we also know there's an antitypical Cyrus, who is a deliverer. He's the rock of chapter 2, he's the son of God of chapter 3, he's the angel uh, in chapter 3 and chapter 6, because he's the angel who shuts the mouths of the lions. He's the unseen hand, the watcher. He's the son of man. He's the Messiah prince. He's Michael who stands. So Jesus is in every chapter. Sometimes he is, you know, kind of hidden, concealed a little bit, but we know he's the one who stands up for Daniel in chapter 1, even though he's not you know, specifically there. But then he's fully revealed as the... As the um, the book opens. A Christocentric approach to Daniel is crucial to its interpretation. The Messiah Prince drives both, his, both history and narrative. Uh, Jesus is not just the author of prophecy foretold, he is the author of prophecy unfolding. Okay? He makes it happen. And so the Messiah Prince 
is the key pivot point in, in history and narrative and prophecy. So the next exhibit, 490 years of national probation. So we're all on, uh, familiar with uh, Daniel chapter 9. This is actually a key uh, prophecy. Uh, Daniel, there, there are several links between Daniel 9 and the Day of Atonement, and many of these have been brought out in our literature. Daniel's uh, Yada uh, prayer of confession. It's, he uses a word which is used in Leviticus uh, 16, when he, at the, both at the beginning and the end of his prayer. Uh, the 70 weeks would equal 10 jubilee cycles. Jubilee years were declared on a Day of Atonement. Okay, the, the jubilee year was declared on a Day of Atonement uh, specifically. The reference to the most holy and atone, these are words that are very key in Leviticus 16. There are the synonyms for sin that are used in Daniel's prayer that are, uh, and also in the, the six um, kind of key performance indicators, I call them, that the Jews were supposed to uh, fulfill within that um, 70 weeks. They are also found, or a cognate of them is found in uh, in Leviticus 16. And then there's the, the important one here is cut off. Messiah would be cut off and have nothing. This word cut off is found in Leviticus 23 when it talks about on the Day of Atonement, anyone who had not, uh, you know, been penitent and um, humbled themselves, they were to be cut off from their people. It's the same word cut off. Jesus was going to be cut off in the same way that the impenitent were on the Day of Atonement. So there's a lot of these things that are... Um, linking the, the passages. But 70 weeks, we often don't think of it, even though we might kind of generally think of it as a, a probationary period, we don't think of what that means with the implications of the 70 weeks, the 490 years being a probation. Well, cutoff is a term, you know, and this is the different cutoff. This is the, the 70 weeks of cutoff for your people, uh, sorry, for, uh, for your people. This term cutoff is uh, not the same one as Jesus, the prince being cut off, but it's interesting that there's a, probably a semantic overlap there. This is often used in judgment contexts. Uh, Ellen White refers to the period of 490 years as added probation. She wrote that as a nation, their probation closed at the death of Christ and that they sealed this rejection at the stoning of Stephen. And there's a lot of reasons why we can, you know, and my paper goes through a lot of reasons why stoning of Stephen is a fitting end date for the 70 uh, weeks. But... Stephen's discourse, one of the main ones is Stephen's discourse has been identified, and I, I don't uh, speak Hebrew uh, fluently, so a uh, rib, uh, something like that, um, as a covenant lawsuit. It's a, he, was, he was basically relaying, Stephen was relaying the history of Israel and saying, look at all of the failures that you've had. He goes from um, our fathers at the beginning of the speech to your fathers. Our fathers did this, our fathers did this, our fathers did this, your fathers showing a, a separation, showing a, a line of demarcation. Now it's you're divorced, you're cut off because you're about to stone, um, you're, you're about to kill Christ again in the person of his saints. So the 70 weeks mark the end of national Jewish prophetic significance. It's a close of probation, that's it. Once your probation is closed, you, you pass off the scene of significance prophetically. Okay, so that's the, the third exhibit, exhibit D, Israel in type and anti-type. Now, there's two Israels in Scripture. Uh, it comes from this verse, this is the clearest verse that we have that show that there's two meanings of the word Israel. Not all who are of Israel are Israel. Okay, this is in Romans, Romans chapter 9. Uh, Ellen White kind of uses the terms literal Israel and spiritual Israel. She did such in a time when there was no state of Israel. I think that can be confusing today to talk about literal Israel and spiritual Israel because there is a state of Israel. So I think a better way to describe it would be typical Israel and anti-typical Israel, and we'll get into why that is. So there was a waning of national Israel. National Israel was defined by borders and bloodlines. There was the land that they were literally in, and there was the bloodlines by, by which they proved their, their right to belong to that land. Uh, Jesus told the Samaritan woman that the geographical temple itself would fade away in importance when she came to him and said, you know, your ancestors worship on this mountain, ours on this mountain, which one? You know, trying to trip him up, trying to give him something to deflect from, from her own feelings of in, uncomfortableness. And he said, lady, the, the day is coming when neither on this mountain or that mountain, 
but the true worshippers will worship in spirit and in truth. And so uh, as you go through Scripture after that point, after the death of Christ, they talk about Jerusalem, which is above, mother of all. It talks about the church of the firstborn, which is in heaven. Uh, And so this idea of a Jerusalem above starts to come out, especially through Revelation. So uh, this temple and this Jerusalem above. Uh, Jesus told Pilate that the, his kingdom was not of this world. Notice that Jesus has some of the clearest conversations with non-Jews because they, they're not bogged down by the bloodlines and borders. He, and he says, look, my kingdom is not of this world. Don't worry. And so we've got this idea that there's a kingdom that surpasses borders and bloodlines. True Israel is, not about, is about character, not about, consen- uh, not about census. Okay, so a, a Christocentric Israel starts to come out as we go through the New Testament, which is the true reason for Israel in the first place. Jesus called Nathaniel an Israelite indeed. Paul wrote about being a Jew inwardly. He says, Jew, a Jew is not one who is one uh, inward, uh, outwardly, but one that is one inwardly. And the curious thing that he says at the end is, he says, whose praise is of God, not of man. Now, what does the word Judah mean? The word Judah means praise. In fact, when Leah was giving birth to Judah, she says, um, I'll praise Yahweh. And so what Paul is actually saying, he's saying it's those who live up to the purpose and name of Judah is a true Jew, someone who praises, whose praises of God, not of man. Paul highlighted a faith-based descent from Abraham, something that was quite radical because he was looking at the fact that pre-circumcision, Abraham was called the father of many, and through him all nations, Goyim, were to be blessed. It was supposed to be something that was to embrace the whole world. Uh, Paul applies Old Testament prophecies, and and I recommend reading this section of my paper because he applies Old Testament prophecies that regard northern Israel, the coming again, the gathering again of northern Israel to the Gentiles. If you read it carefully, it's a very It's probably one of those passages that Peter was thinking of, uh, Romans 9 to 11, when he was saying, oh, you know, that Paul, he says a few things that are are difficult to understand. That's probably the one that he had in mind. So typical Israel is geographic and genetic, temporary, uh, temporal and temporary. That's that's what, uh, you know, it had an end date. It had a probationary period. But anti-typical Israel is cosmic. It's spiritual, it's transcendent, and it's eternal. It's the true Israel that was ever meant to be. Uh, the, the, one, the branches that were cut off, that was typical Israel, but the trunk was the, was the eternal Israel. It was the, the Israel, the, the whole family in heaven and earth. Um, so just to understand what typology is, you know, the best definition and probably the most wordy definition, because to ca- kind of give something, do something justice, you've got to uh, put in a lot of words. Richard Davidson says, typology as a hermeneutical endeavor on the part of the biblical writers may be viewed as the study of certain Old Testament salvation historical realities, persons, events, or institutions. Now, note these words specifically, persons, events, or institutions, because I know that in the question and answer time, I'm probably going to get some questions about, well, what is spiritual, what is not spiritual? I know that's been something that has, uh, Dr. Gain uh, made on both... Uh, versions of my paper that he, he uh, referenced. He's like, well, is it, well it's, it's persons, events, and institutions. That's the things that we know are uh, typical, especially according to the study that Davidson and others have done, which God has specifically designed to correspond to and be prospective, predictive prefigurations, try saying that quickly, of their ineluctable and absolutely escalated eschatological fulfillment aspects. Christological, eschatological, apocalyptic in New New Testament salvation history. That could probably be about three different sentences, but, you know, I I gave a bit of time for you to kind of digest that. We might put that up a bit later if we need to. Exhibit E. So we've got type, uh, Israel in type and anti-type. There's a, Israel was a a bloodline and border-bound entity, but it became a cosmic entity. It became a, a transcendent entity that embraced all who believed. So exhibit A, we're going to start putting these things together, overlaying Daniel 11 upon Daniel 2, 7, 8, and 9. So let's have a look at some of the parallels, Medo-Persia and Greece. Uh, In chapter 8, verse 20, the ram you saw, these are the kings of Media and Persia. In 11, verse 1, three more kings shall arise in Persia and a fourth. Uh, 8, verse 21, and the goat is the king of Greece, and the great horn between his eyes is the first king. 11 verse 3, then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion and do as he wills. As for uh, 
8 verse 22, as for the horn that was broken in the place which four others arose, four kingdoms shall arise from his nation, but not with his power. Uh, 11 verse 4, and as soon as he is arisen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not according to the authority with which he ruled. Can you see some parallels here? There's some, some of the linguistic, some are thematic, uh, some are uh, lin um, literary. Uh, Daniel, Roman Messiah, so we're in the Roman Messiah phase. In Daniel 8, it says, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles shall arise. In Daniel 11, in his place shall arise a contemptible person. Uh, in Daniel 8, 11, it became great, even as great as the prince of the host. In 8, 5, it says, and he shall arise up against the prince of princes. In 9, 25 to 26, an anointed one, a prince, uh, an anointed one shall be cut off and have nothing. In 11 verse 22, we've got armies shall be utterly swept away before him and broken, even the prince of the covenant. So we've got this prince of the covenant, prince of princes, anointed one, a prince. This, uh, this is a synchronism. We can see that these parallel up. They, these are lining up. The next main one is the uh, daily and the abomination. Uh, I've given you just some phrases here. Uh, a host will be given over, over to it, forces from him shall appear, the place of his sanctuary was overthrown, profane the temple and fortress, and the daily was, you know, whether it's lifted up or taken away, we could debate that another time, and he shall take away the daily, uh, chapter 11, verse 31, um, uh, the transgression that makes desolate shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. There's no dispute here, there's no way we can dispute, that. these are literary, these are the strongest types of parallels that we could have, they're not just thematic. Uh, then there's the persecution phase. We've got descriptions of persecution in Daniel 8 by the little horn and in Daniel 11. Uh, it will act and prosper. The king shall do as he wills. He shall prosper. Then there's this, this pride that is revealed about this. He shall speak words against the Most High in chapter 7 and 8. Um, he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and speak astonishing things against the God of gods. Uh, chapter 8, 19, I, I will make known to you what shall be the latter end of the indignation. 11, 36, he shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished, for what is decreed shall be done. Uh, 8, 24, his power shall be great, but not by his own power. 11, 39, he shall deal with the strongest fortresses with the help of a foreign god. So we've got linguistic again and thematic parallels here. And then we've got the time of the end. Daniel 8 uh, has the vision as for the time of the end. Daniel 11, at the time of the end. Uh, Daniel 8, he shall cause fearful destruction. 11, he shall go out with fury to destroy and devote many to destruction. 8, 25, he shall be broken but uh, by no human hand. 11, 45, he shall come to his end with none to help him. So we've got the, the, this parallel of the, let's call it the curriculum vitae of this same power is, is going through the entire two chapters. Daniel 11 is made clear through parallels with earlier prophecies. That's the key point for this exhibit. Exhibit F, Daniel's people in Daniel 10, and 12, 10 to 12. What is the purpose of these vision, this, this explanation, this final explanation of Daniel 8, as uh, Kim Kier was saying? It's to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days. Why? Well, when, when did we last hear your people? Well, it was in Daniel chapter 9, and it was in regards to a limited probationary period. But your people appears in Daniel uh, 12, verse 1. So Michael stands for your people. Is he going to stand for the people who've already passed their probation? Who did the probation ap apply to in Daniel, uh, Daniel 9? It didn't apply to God's true church. It applied to a genetic uh, limited group. So your people at least for the first half of the prophecy, leading up to the broken Messiah Prince, is a genetic, typical, uh, bloodline and border-bound people. Yet your people continues through the chapter. We see the exact phrase, your people, in Daniel 12, verse 1, but we see the, the word people, the same word people, now it's the wise people in, uh, in, the, in the middle verses of the second half of the chapter. So the people continues, but there's been a subtle transition. Um, so there's violent ones among your people. I'm, I can't wait to exegete this one uh, tomorrow. Uh, it, either violent ones against, but or violent ones amongst. But it's still your people is is found in chapter 11, verse 14. 
And then in verse 32 to 35, the people who know their God, the wise among their people. These are, this is another instance of this people. And then finally in 12 verse 1, the children of your people. So not only in chapter 10 is it said that this, the purpose of this explanation is to say what's going to happen to your people, of which we know there was a probation for the literal genetic people that finished at the breaking of the, the time that the Messiah is cut off, but it continues through. It continues past the breaking of the Messiah in verse 32 and 30 to 35, and also again in verse 1 of chapter 12. Israel is at the center of this prophecy, the vantage point from which north and south are measured. So if in the first half of this prophecy it's overlaid with chapter 9, which it deals with typical Israel, north and south are going to be literal. But Daniel's people, uh, so Daniel's people are typical up to verse 22, after which national Israel's probation ends. And if national Israel's probation ends, but the people continue, it cannot be national Israel anymore. It has to be a different Israel, a transcendent Israel. The antitypical Israel has emerged from the view, into view. Daniel's people in the second half must be antitypical Israel because otherwise the probation means nothing, the Daniel 9 probation. We often talk about overlaying this chapter with previous chapters, but we don't see the significance that, yes, Daniel 11 is an explanation of Daniel 8, but we've also got another explanation. Daniel 9 was an explanation of Daniel 8, a partial one. Okay, Daniel may have been concerned for his genetic king, but prophecy addresses the destiny of Daniel's spiritual king. Excuse me. (coughs) (coughs) Okay, exhibit G. The Messiah type, anti-type pivot. Now, I want to talk about what a pivot is. We often think about, if, if it's a change from literal to spiritual, there's a complete radical substitution. Has anyone seen Indiana Jones where he's, he's about to get that treasure and he has to substitute it for something else immediately uh, of an equal weight, otherwise the ball's going to start rolling, the, the big boulder's going to start chasing him. It's not like that, it's a pivot. A pivot is where you put one foot here and you, you move from this foot here to this foot here. So you've still got a, a, a central point, a hinge between those two points. So what I'm talking about is in that context, all apocalyptic prophecy, as we've seen, is Israel-centric. National, national Israel's probation closes after the Prince of the Covenant is broken. All reference to the people of the covenant must thereafter refer to antitypical Israel, The prophetic pivot point, the 70th week, marks the transition from type to anti-type. Now, here's the key. So the Messiah, at this point where he's cut off, as a point point which, you know, says that that's when Israel, typical Israel, is divorced. There's still an Israel that continues. It can't be the same Israel. That means we've had a pivot. We've had a pivot where Jesus is at the center between these two Israels, these two understandings of Israels, one where typical Israel is dominant, and the emergence of anti-typical Israel, which always existed, by the way. I'm not saying anti-typical Israel didn't exist. It was always existent, just like the, the new covenant was actually before the old covenant. Okay, the anti-typical Israel actually pre-existed typical Israel, but it emerged as the, as the dominant understanding of Israel after Jesus. You can't have powers, here's the key, you can't have powers to the north and south of a geographically transcendent people. If Israel has no longer been bound by bloodlines and borders, then north and south mean something else. There's still going to be a pivot. There's still going to be a point where, okay, we can see a a, a succession. There's still going to be a literal succession, but it's not going to be bound to a location because Israel is not bound to a location. Daniel 11 has two parts, both leading up to Christ. The first half leads up to Christ being broken. The second half leads up to Christ being triumphant and standing for his people. You know, just to step back a little bit to a missiological um, perspective platform. We want to have, like, the the reason we don't speak on Daniel 11 too much is because it's very, like, Daniel 11, according to the Uriah Smith view, is quite dry. You know, it's very details and facts, and if we can cut it in half, we could do Daniel 11 over two sessions instead of trying to get it all in one, 
And the best point is at the middle of this chapter, which leads, you know, you, you do the first half of Daniel 11, there's Jesus. You do the second half of Daniel 11, it's Jesus. And you can fold it in half that way. Especially if you're looking at a type and anti-type. You're teaching, you can teach people from a, a hermeneutic of this is what type is, this is what anti-type is. Uh, so let's look at the, the, this is final additional confirmation. There's probably more. I actually thought of a new one that wasn't in my paper that I put into the slides at the last minute. So there's additional confirmations. One of the objections is, well, that doesn't happen. You know, literal, it's, it's, we don't see things transition from literal to spiritual or typical to anti-typical in the middle of a, of a literary unit. Well, actually, we do. And we actually have it in, as a part of our major teachings. You know, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. We go from a literal prince of Tyre to a spiritual identity king of Tyre. In Ezekiel 28, we've got King of Babylon moving to uh, Halel ben Shakar, the the Lucifer figure. The, <clears throat> the these prophecies begin with literal human reference and segue or pivot to a supernatural entity that's behind the scenes. The transition is not easily perceptible from a, a surface reading. It, from a surface reading, this is why a lot of uh, interpreters out there do dispute with us about this because they go, well, no, it's, it's just the king of Babylon. It's, the, it's a literal person in Tyre. Okay, well, how do you explain why he was in Eden? You know, obviously, you've got to do some scripture upon scripture. It's not explicit. Um, while there are literary and linguistic clues to the transition, it is chiefly through intertextual comparisons that the transition is d d discerned. Daniel 10 actually, now this is the point that wasn't in my paper, I was just thinking about it. Daniel 10 establishes an in-context precedent for spiritual identities for royal figures. I was lay waylaid by the Prince of Persia. It's not actually a person, it was, it was a supernatural entity behind the Prince of Persia, Prince of Greece. This, these entities were dualistic in the sense that, yes, it was a person behind, like a, an entity behind that. So there's this in-context um, precedent for a spiritual identity behind a royal figure. <clears throat> then we've got the synoptic apocalypse, which, which has been brought up in the question period for Pastor Cure. Uh, Jesus is answering two distinct questions that are being posed to him. One regarding to the destruction of Jerusalem, these things, the things he'd just been talking about, and, and Richard Davidson does an amazing job. If you want to look up a paper that's exceptional on this, it's um, this generation shall not pass away by uh, Dr. Davidson. And the, the other part is the, the other question that he's answering is about his coming in the end of the world. Because the disciples came to him and they're like, he, they've just heard him talk about Jerusalem being destroyed. And he, he comes to them and he says, well, look, um, it's, you know, well, they, they say, when are these things going to be? And when is it going to be the sign of your coming in the end of the world? To them, it was all going to happen at once. But he actually answered it in two different ways. Jesus answers these separately, but with a subtle blending where the destruction of Jerusalem prefigures the end of the world. It's a, it's a, it's a type of what will happen at the end of the world. Uh, these two links, events are linked to Daniel's prophecies. Uh, Raymar Vetney and um, Hugo Leon have both written well about how these, the, the synoptic apocalypse draws from Daniel 8, 9, and 11 where the destruction of Jerusalem is a consequence of the uh, failure to do the, the six key performance indicators within the 490 years, and the rest is at the close of the, uh, of the time of the end. Uh, the synoptic apocalypse confirms a type-antitype relation between genetic Israel and transcendent Israel. Now, this one is a little bit more disputable in terms of the specifics, but I want to just do this in a general way. Revelation confirms that Egypt, the land of the king of the south, takes on a representative spiritual identity. I'm not saying that it, in, in um, Revelation chapter 11 we've got an exact overlay on Daniel 11. I'm just saying that the idea of Egypt representing a spiritual entity is there. And we've also got Babylon, the land of the king of the north, because the king of the north in almost all of its iterations controlled, like before chapter, before verse 22, controlled Babylon, before it became, uh, you know, anti-typical. It takes on a representative spiritual identity in Revelation 14 to 18. This further illustrates that after the cross, Old Testament geographical entities such as Egypt and Babylon had become understood by some typical symbolic um, 
to be typical or symbolic of eschatological realities. A hermeneutical pivot in Daniel 11 is both precedented and warranted. It's not unprecedented, it's not unwarranted, there is reason for it to be there. So I'm now at, the, at my time anyway, so I can take questions. Okay, carry on. Um, okay, so one thing I added to my paper at the request of Dr. Gain, and I, uh, I'm just going to go through these points. Uh, these are things that I would expect for the second half of the chapter. I'm not going to go dig myself into an interpretation. I don't actually have one. I've got, I, I lean this way on this, these verses and another way on a few others. I think that's the job of the rest of this conference. But I would expect a Christocentric, covenant-centric and Israel-centric view of history when seeking to connect the prophecy to world events. I would expect a focus on transcendent, anti-typical Israel growing out of typical Israel after the close of Jewish national probation. I would expect a corresponding pivot to transcendent, anti-typical identifications to king of the north and king of the south. Now, by a pivot, I remember, I mean there's, a, there's still a literal succession. Okay, It's not like all of a sudden it's some completely new entity that has nothing to do. It's like there's, the, the words, in his place shall arise, are very important in verse 20 and 21, and which give that succession. Uh, for an ongoing chronological progression should be expected, extraordinary reversion would need to be strongly justified with literary and linguistic evidence. What that means is I wouldn't expect it to go forward and then, okay, we're all the way back here at the league that the Jews made with, you know, I, that doesn't, that would need to be demonstrated. You, uh, the, the natural progression of the prophecy is forward towards Michael. Uh, in the same way, uh, fast forward would be expected. There's a time where it jumps from, you know, Xerxes all the way, oh, now we're at um, Alexander the Great. And there's, it also skips over, you know, future Seleucids and Ptolemies to get to Rome. Yes, we would expect fast forwards, but we would expect them to be justified. We wouldn't expect, one of the things I have a bit of a, a problem with, and uh, until I can see it justified, is the jump immediately to the Crusades. From the cross to the Crusades, there needs to be some reason. So we need to look at that and say, okay, there's got to be some justification here. Uh, a clear line of succession for the king of the north by Rome as a republic and then as an empire as demonstrated by the jewel in his place shall arise. I'm hoping that will come forward uh, during the panel discussions. Lacking an explicit successor for the king of the south, this power should be seen throughout the chapter as a power or powers standing opposed to Rome by the time of the middle of the chapter and into which conflict anti-typical Israel is caught up. Now, this is something that where I lean towards Tim Hayden's understanding of uh, the verses immediately after verse 22. Because the territory of the king of the north and the king of the south was consolidated by Rome at the time the prophecy pivots to anti-type, the first conflict between these powers in verses 25 to 29 should be internal civil war conflict. That's what it seems to be describing uh, within Imperial Rome. Number nine, a panorama of history of Imperial and pa Papal Rome, including the transitions between these two phases in line with the earlier prophetic outlines. So what I mean by that is in Daniel 8, we've got a, uh, a transition from papal to, uh, pagan to papal. I'd, want, I'd, I'd be expecting to see that in, in chapter 11 as well. I'd be expecting to see a shift towards transitions between time phases. In the first half of the chapter, you've got very specific details between this king and then this king, and then he's going to give his daughter, and all this very specific details, but gets much more, uh, much less specific by the, uh, after the middle of the chapter. Now it's dealing with, for a time, time times and half a time, time of the end. You've got these times. It's, it's transitioning between times by this stage. Time is not a factor in the first half. It's a big factor in the second half. I'd expect to see synchronization, synchronization between time elements in this chapter and those found in earlier chapters. By this, I would say, I, I mean, when we see time of the end in chapter 11 uh, and 12, where do we first see that? We see that in chapter 8. There's only one time period mentioned there. That We'd need to look at why it would have to, why, would it, why would it be 1798 when the time of the end is described in connection first with the 2300? Um, there, I would expect to see identification of intertextual links between earlier and contemporary Hebrew prophets uh, to give context to the symbols of the prophecy and finally confirmation through New Testament commentary and apocalyptic. Um, so a pivot from type to anti-type is at the intersection of hermeneutics, Christolo Christology, ecclesiology and eschatology.
You know, this is, this is something where we've, got, we've overlaid several different macro uh, themes of Scripture, several different uh, systematic themes. When they intersect, they say, there's a pivot here. There's a, we're going from type to anti-type. The first advent is the event on which prophecy and history hinges, pivoting from, a local, from local to global, transient to transcendent, type to anti-type. Now, this is just a question to, to end on a bit of brevity after a fair bit of talking. How do you know that Thanksgiving has come early at this conference? I know it was just Canadian Thanksgiving the other day. How do you know? Because we just had roast turkey. I don't think there's, there's any room for turkey in this view. Okay, turkey, turkey doesn't really have a place. Okay, questions? All right, uh, and for vegans like me, we have roast potatoes. So, I <laughs> uh, don't see them in the prophecy either, brother. So, okay, that was uh, an excellent uh, presentation. Um, when, when Brother Rendon, he sent his, his first paper into the committee, we to look at it and thought, wow, there's a lot of thought gone into this, and he covers a lot of material, is very detailed, and he addresses many of the underlying questions that we're often uh, discussing. And uh, I'd like to thank you for the fact that the, 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 the study, um, the, the research you've done, it, it shines through in, 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 in your presentation today. So thank you very much, Brother Brendan. All right, uh, comments and questions. Uh, at the back here, can you give us your name first, Brother? Uh, and then give us your question. Doug Singh from Berrien Springs. I like very much your presentation here, but uh, I do have a question with regard to the switch that uh -huh. uh, you and some of the others perhaps also make from the king of the north to Rome. Mm -hmm. I do not see any justification for that in this chapter. I think it's based on some preconceived ideas from previous chapters. Uh, now, as you know from history, the king of the north, uh, the Seleucids and the uh, Ptolemies were both absorbed by Rome. So in other words, uh, Rome becomes both the king of, king of the north and the king of the south, which cannot be. It's impossible. So uh, I don't see in this chapter any justification for a switch from the king of the north or a king of the south or both mm -hmm. to Rome. Uh, so let me ask you about that question yeah. first. Se uh, secondly, I would like to make a comment with regard to the parallels between chapter 8 and chapter 11, also going back to chapter 7. Uh, Adventist theology has historically viewed both the little horns mentioned in chapter 7 and chapter 8 to be the papacy. I don't see any justification for that if we read the characteristics given for that person. Mm -hmm. And this brother earlier mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, he read that section from chapter 8, that this is a person. And yes, I believe it is a person because chapter 8 is talking about the end time false prophet, whereas chapter 7 is talking about the end time antichrist. So yes, these are two individuals who according to Revelation, I believe chap chapter 11 or chapter 13 perhaps, mm -hmm. work together. The false prophet is the one who declares the antichrist to be God. Mm -hmm. And that is brought out later in chapter 11 of Daniel. So anyway, I would like for you to answer that first question, and then I would like to hear about your views on what I have just said with regard to the Antichrist and the false prophets. Uh, because then you talk about the time of the end. Yes. Uh, the end shall be at the time appointed. Uh -huh. so, this in all the chapters of Daniel, chapter 2, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 11, chapter 12, that it talks about the historical phase first, and then very quickly it uh,
culminates with the time of the end. Okay, so I'll, and I'll we see that in chapter 9 also. Yep, so I'll take the first question, and to, to a large extent I'll defer it to the panel discussions that we're going to be having, because I think a lot of that's going to be dependent. But the reason that I see uh, Rome becoming the king of the north is due to several linguistic reasons. One of them is because I, I agree with uh, Dr. Gaines' idea that Antiochus III, Antiochus the Great, goes right up to verse 19, and then you see this phrase, in his place shall arise, meaning that the next figure that comes on is in the place of the previous figure. The previous figure was the king of the north, so that means he would inherit the title and uh, aspects of the king of the north. We see this phrase earlier in the chapter, in I think verse 7, when there's a new person who comes into the possession of the king of the south, he, you know, in his place, in the king of the south's place, shall arise another entity who will still be the king within, within the, Ptolemy, the, the, the Ptolemaic empire that will be the new king of the south. So I see that as the reason, the first reason for the just, to why Rome becomes the king of the north, because he's in the place of the king north. Second is the pronouns. The, the, the fact that the pronouns just continue, he, 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 it's continuing to be he, the last um, subject, the last explicit subject was king of the north. And so I see that the, the he's continue to be the person who's in the place of the king of the north. So that's why I see that. Now, I agree with you that, the, that Rome did embrace king of the north and south. So the next north and south conflict, I would expect to be within Rome. It would be a, a factional civil war within Rome, which is why I think Hayden's view has, has some merit. Uh, I, I think that it needs a lot more work to be, to be looking at it, but I, I see some merit there. Uh, with your other thing about, you know, one, chapter 8 being the Antichrist and chapter 9, uh, sorry, chapter, um, chapter 7 being the Antichrist, chapter 9 being the false prophet, they're both called the little horn. Uh, I, I think that there's definitely some you know, there's, there's no room to consider them as two different entities. They might be a bit more of an expanded entity, expanded view in chapter 8, because I see two phases of the little horn in chapter 8. The origin of the little horn is so far distant that it just, it appears to Daniel to be coming out of one of the four winds. You know, it says, out of one of them shall arise a little horn. It's, it's coming, and it's snakes. If you have a look at it, if you imagine Daniel having this vision, he's seeing this snaking horn, this serpentine figure, that snakes that go south and then east and then to the glorious land and then it arises up to the hosts of the heaven, you know, like it, it goes upward vertically. So I don't see room for it to be two entities because why would Daniel 7 and Daniel 9, uh, 8 call it the little horn? They call it the same name. So that's, that's why I see it as the same entity. Uh, I would add to that... If that, I would just add oh, to well, that one, one minute, brother. I, I would add to Brother Brendan there that I think there are some quite clear... Um, parallels, not just between mm. the little horn of Daniel 8 and the king of the north in Re Daniel 11, but also between the man of sin in Second Thessalonians 2, yep. together with um, Daniel 8, little horn, and then what we see in Daniel 11. So I think that we see in both New and Old Testament a clear parallel between a single figure, the man of sin of Second, second Thessalonians 2. There are some very clear um, parallel concepts used to describe this entity. Um, you had one other question. Can you just remind us very briefly what your question was? The idea that there are multiple kings, multiple the little, the little horns represent different actors. Is that your idea? Well, I just have one comment to make where you said that uh, in chapter 8, the little horn arises out of the four winds. It does not say that. It arises out of those four kingdoms, not the four winds. Grammatically, that is in dispute, and I think uh, I, I tend to go with the out of one of them referring to the winds, not to the horns. It, well, it, it's, it's, in, it's, it's ambiguous, but the grammar, the gender, appears to what I read, to how I read it. It comes out of one of the four winds. Basically, the, the way that it reads to me is that the four winds start pushing to the... Sorry, the four horns start pushing towards the four winds, and then out of one of those winds, something pushes back. And that's what you see Rome. Rome is pushing back. It's this little horn is pushing back against the, the expansion of the horns. Yeah, I think, yeah, Brother that's, Duke... That's not how the angel interpreted that, though. That's, he that's, specifically mentioned out of uh, these four kingdoms. Yeah, there is, a, there is a problem we have in our English translations. Sometimes in these passages, it adds, maybe say, the king, then it adds of the north. Or, mm. or it adds 
explanatory glosses which are not justified by the underlying text. Mm. And in this passage here that shall arise out of one of them, does the them refer to the, the kingdoms or to the winds? And I think that there's a difference in the masculine or the feminine. I don't remember what it is, but I read it many years ago. I know there's a difference. And we interpret it, therefore, as coming out of one of the four winds. And there's a directional element here. Um, brother, uh, br brother at the back, and then Brother Hugo Leon. So, Thank you for your presentation. Do you want to swap that mic? OK, you can try again, brother. Thank you with my wife. I am a marriage counsellor, so there is that. Traditionally, we apply 725 historically. No problem with that with me. Okay, so Daniel 7.25, he'll speak words against the Most High, will harass the Holy Ones of the Most High continually. His intention will be to change times and laws. Is that the one you're talking about? Yes, sir. And you're asking me whether I see it eschatologically? Yes, because I see it in the book of Revelation. I see the fulfillment of 7.25 in the book of Revelation. So to me, it's eschatological. But I am, I am so uh, happy with your presentation. And I would like to see how you, the language, in my opinion, is applicable to historically and eschatologically. Well, but look, I wanted to see how you react to that. I, I don't think that there, after the cross, it's all eschatology, in a sense. You know, the New Testament talks about it's the end times after Jesus, in that sense. So really, for that to be happening in the, the 1260 period, is leading up to the eschatology. It's, it's all eschatological by that stage because we're, after the cross, we're in the, the tension between the now and the not yet. And so there's this definite, uh, like I, I don't see there needs to be a second application there if, if that's what you're asking. I, I think that that's something that's already happened, that's already done. Um, it's ongoing, it's like done, but with a continual application, they still have changed the times and laws. Uh, that's, that's how I understand that. All right, and just to follow up on that, um, last year, Brother Nelson, you gave a presentation on, on this kind of pivot, the pivot from the literal to the spiritual, for want of a better word. How did you respond to this, these ideas today? Because this was quite systematic in laying out the case for such a pivot, but I don't remember that it, it, it matched exactly what you were saying last year. So as you were kind of thinking along the same lines, how did you respond to what was shared just now? Um, yeah, I, I read his paper yesterday on my travels here, and uh, I was very, I mean, a lot of really good points. Um, I, I am in much agreement with my brother on, on all the reasons as to what he has laid out. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, I mean, I, I, I have a, a reason in verse 23 that I feel is compelling that makes a transition. And it happens to be at the very same place that, that my brother's making that argument for. And I agree with all the, all the points that he's brought up uh, for these things. So I, I'd like to talk to him more. OK, thank you. Uh, we had uh, Brother Hugo Lean and then Brother Greg Bratcher, and then Pastor Tim Rosenberg. We will work our way through these one at a time. Um, if you want to talk, raise your hand, and you'll be added to the queue. I like your hermeneutical principles. And one principle there I just want to mention, you don't have to answer this necessarily, is the one that the New Testament confirms the interpretation of Daniel you know, 10 through 12. Mm. And I see a great lack, and I'm appealing to the group and especially to our New Testament theologians, mm. there's a great lack of studies in our church as to how the book of Revelation interprets Daniel 10 to 12. 
Yeah. We've done good work in how it interprets Daniel 7, Daniel 8. So I'm appealing to our group. Let's do studies on how Revelation interprets Daniel 10 to 12. I'd agree. Okay, thank you. Uh, Brother Greg Bratcher, and then these two guys here in the middle. Yes. One of the things is I've looked at, uh, you bring up some excellent points, and I, I appreciate what you've shared with us. Um, can you hear me? And uh, you've brought up some great points, and, I, and, I, and, you're, and I'm soaking in a little bit more of what you just shared about the change that yeah. takes place uh, around the middle of Daniel 11. Um, but what I'm left with after I've looked at that is that there are still these literal, this word Eretz in Hebrew, land, the land of Libya, the land of Moab, the land, the land, the land is emphasized. Mm -hmm. And if we're really talking about a spiritual discussion or a typological discussion, I'm not sure which, yeah. uh, what difference does it matter what happens in that land? I don't see, look, I, that land, the, the, the mention of these lands is often used as a reason why we should continue to, to seek a literal application. I actually think it's the, it actually gives reason the opposite because it mentions specifically three nations that no longer exist today as those nations. It mentions Moab, Edom, and Ammon. Those don't exist anymore. So what we have to do is we have to actually go for a spiritual application anyway uh, where we go, okay, well, now it's Jordan, or now it's this other way that we look at those, th those regions. But it says Ammon, um, Edom, and, and Moab. They don't exist. So obviously something has changed. Something has, but those, those three are listed in a passage in, uh, which includes the mention of Libya and a lot of the other, one, other lands that are mentioned in Isaiah 11. I think Isaiah 11, because in one of my things that I expected, and I, I didn't go into this, but I think Isaiah 11 has quite a few uh, thematic and linguistic links with the last six verses of Daniel 11. And Isaiah 11 is a part of a passage that's talking about the gathering of the remnant. And so I see that as a description of the gathering of the remnant that is occurring here. So what was Moab? What was Edom? What was Ammon? They were cousins of the Jews. They were cousins. So I would be looking that at that time, the, the, the part that escapes the king of the north in the end are going to be those, those um, spiritual kin. So that would be um, Protestants, um, you know, the true-hearted in Protestantism, in, uh, Israel, like in Judaism, and in Islam. In the Abrahamic religions, they're our spiritual kin, closest to us, if, if that makes sense. Just like the, the others were literal yeah. genetic kin. Yeah. Uh, just a, that's an interesting point. I know that some of our interpreters have, have taken that position. But coming back to Greg's question about the land of Ammon, the land of Edom, and so forth, we know those nations don't exist today. Mm -hmm. You know, they're basically uh, Jordan and, yes. and so forth. But when, when Daniel gave this prophecy, nobody knew then that the land of Jordan, as we understand it, would exist. And so if he writes it in a way that would be understood in his time, exactly. he lists yeah. these nations... Not that they will exist in 2,600 years' time, but that the original readers would, if it's to be understood literally, that this is the geographical territory where this is going to take place. Okay, so... It's just a, yeah, a counterpoint no, I, to what you I were saying. I understand that. The, the way that I see it in the, in the macro sense is, in the first half of the chapter, especially if you take the Antiochus the, the third view, he, he ma manages do to dominate everywhere except for Egypt. Mm -hmm. And yet in the last six verses, you've got the king of the north who actually dominates Egypt to the furthest extents of Egypt, mm -hmm. um, goes all the way to Libya, down to Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. it, it pretty much dominates. So what I see is that describing that the antitypical king of the north is going to dominate all the... Like, the king of the north and the king of the south, uh, one is a, per, a perverting power, and the other one is a hostile, like, anti... Um, like, uh, against like against Judaism altogether, the other one is perverting or um, upending Judaism. Yeah, and of course the challenge for us as modern Adventist interpreters is that if you just look at the news in the last year, you have Turkey explicitly claim, wanting the mantle of leading the, the liberation of Jerusalem for the Islamic world, 
Uh, Erdogan is styling himself as the reincarnation of the Ottomans. Mm -hmm. He's built a palace in Ankara, a, a, a copy of the Sultan's palace in, in Constantinople. Constantinople. Yeah. Uh, but we also see, on the spiritual sense, uh, the Pope recently entered into an agreement with many Muslim religious leaders in Dubai. And, and so you can, inter you can look at world events and say there is the Pope seeking to have a, um, a direct influence over what's happening in the Muslim world with this mm. agreement. And we also see in the literal sense to, um, Erdogan leading the charge to liberate Jerusalem, um, Al-Aqsa Mosque, from, Is from Israel. And so the challenge we have as Adventists is we look at these passages and we look at what's happening in the world around us and both of these positions that are out there seem to have some credibility to them. Um, Pastor Rosenberg, uh, and then and then we'll come back to you, Greg. As, you as you a, had a question. As a final thought, though, I, I, okay. think, I still think the false dichotomy is is a good model that we can stay with. Is you know that there is both. It doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. Hmm. Okay, uh, Pastor Rosenberg. Did you want to go first? Go ahead. Okay, um, I want to share that. I believe your paper is one of the best, if not the best, explanation of a symbolic viewpoint. And I appreciate that. I also learned some things of Daniel 8 that I suspected, but you gave me evidence to support it. Uh -huh. So there's a tremendous amount there I'm definitely in agreement with. Okay. So we're really very, very close. Amen. And uh, my thought, as I was asking Kim, what about the twofold? The literal and the globalized. Uh, we have in Daniel 11, it talks about both the people and the land. Mm -hmm. And whatever is happening to the land is in some way happening to the people. You have time periods that what is happening globally to the, God's people of faith and the land. The land of Israel has come and gone out of existence, mm -hmm. as far as the nation of Israel, I should say, but the land is always there. The land of Moab, it's still there, Moab and Ammon, those, yeah. those geographic areas. And so my question simply is, is it possible to have a twofold, a literal first, just like Jesus does in Daniel, I mean, <laughs> Matthew 24, mm. a literal with a globalized for his people of faith application. Yeah. If we could get to that point, we all come together. In the, in the Hebrew mindset, the land is not possible to be divorced from the people. References to the land is references to the people and vice versa. That, that, that's how they understood Israel. So, you know, like the land that I'll call Beulah, it's not, God wasn't saying that the, the, I'm going to marry the land, I'm going to marry the inhabitants of the land. This is the way that the Bible speaks. It speaks uh, in, in a sense that the land is the people. And so my, my answer to that would be, okay, we've, we've obviously switched from a, a literal temple, at least by the time we're talking about the daily being you know, taken away or removed. So we've, we've already moved from something that was in the land now being up there, and now we've got references to the glorious land. It's no longer significant prophetically. The prophetic significance has passed away. And the glorious holy mountain was, again, one of those things which represent... Like, it wasn't glorious because it was a mountain that God declared glorious. It was a glorious because that's where he put his name. The Shekinah was there. That's where the Shekinah had been rested. It was where the temple was located, the inhabitants of God. It's no longer significant that way. All of these other things that are a distraction, one thing that Dr. Vine was saying was, uh, you know, it seems like prophecy might be confirming this, uh, sorry, history, like events in the world might be confirming this interpretation, or they might be, look, I've been an Adventist probably a lot less than many of you here, but ever since I became an Adventist, every new Pope, every new president, you know, there's all this flurry of, he's a Jesuit, he's gonna be the one. It, it, it creates a bit of a fatigue after a while, and I think that's because we aren't meant to be, like the, the main purpose of prophecy is not prediction, it's uh, confirmation of God's providence in, in human history. We aren't meant to be looking at it. We need to have principles that we, we, can, we determine externally without 
looking at history, without, sorry, current events, without looking at current events, because that is the, the quickest way to sensationalistic uh, views, which is what Ellen White talked against. Okay. All right. Um, Dr. Sorry. Gain, did you have something? Do you want to add to that? I was just going to say, in Daniel 11, but it does specifically talk about the people and separately the land. It, I just read through it to make sure on that statement. Uh, but it does do it differentially. Mm -hmm. And so, and historically, um, we can line up how the land and the globalized religious apply all the way through. And very close to what you were just doing yeah. with Edom, Moab, and Ammon. We're so close. We are so close. Mm. All right. Um, Dr. Gain, yeah. and then uh, we have Dr. Nunes behind him, then Brother Tasi. Thank you for that very clear presentation. That really illuminated a lot of aspects that we have to deal with. Thank you. Um, just a couple of things. Daniel 11, verse 40, it refers to the king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and many ships. There again is one of these archaizing elements. And uh -huh. so Moab, Edom, Am uh, Moab, and the main part of the Ammonites, um, it's true that those peoples don't exist now, I mean, we may have some DNA that is traced back to them, but as such, um, but that would be an archaizing element. And the yes. Bible, even within itself, uses archaism. For example, Elam, which was the old name for Persia, is used in the book of Jeremiah. So it's just archaizing. Um, but my, my main question is this. Um, you referred to Dr. Davidson's work on typology and scripture, yes, which is very important, and we discussed that mm. uh, by email. My question is, I was, I was studying his um, book, which is his dissertation recently, and he talks about a, a view of typology that was popular since the time of a guy by the name of Cochius in the 1700s. I'm sure you came across that in his book. And Cochius tried to make a type out of all different kinds of things and have a lot of various details. And Dr. Davidson counters that idea, mm. and he says that a type is more restricted than that. There can be certain details, but they're really major salvific things that are identified in the Old Testament that point forward to New Testament realities mm. and that are, have to do with salvation. They're salvific. But that you can't say that because history repeats itself that therefore it's a type. I'm just citing Dr. Davidson yes. in his definition of a type, which he's trying to develop from within Scripture itself. And so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, we all agree that there is a type and a type relationship between Israel and the church um, in other passages and so on and so on. But what about all the other details? We have just so many details in the latter part of Daniel 11 from, from verses 23 onward. You have, and the language is really very much political, military, and so on, like in the former part of the chapter. And then you have persecution, flame and sword and captivity. Um, those aren't just um, spiritual realities. I mean, people really died. They, they had blood and all the rest of it. So my question would be, if we follow what you're saying to its logical conclusion, are we going to be led into a Cochian view of trying to make a type, anti-type relationship out of everything? Where are the boundaries? How does it stop? And where does the land of Israel fit into that? One other brief thing about the land of Israel, and that is we all agree that um, with what you said about Daniel 9, and the land of Israel no longer, and the people of Israel no longer have that literal ethnic significance. We all agree on that. Hmm. Um, the question is, however, do uh, the king of the north and the king of the south know that and accept that? And, <laughs> and, and perhaps, perhaps the references to Israel and these other countries have to do with their perspective, and they're fighting over this literally, like, for example, the Crusades, we can talk about that, could and in, fact, in fact, did historically greatly affect the people of God tremendously. So we're not talking about that we accept that it's um, that Israel continues to have that prophetic significance, but perhaps with with relation to the people of um, uh, of these. And and of course, Daniel is interested in the land and how this uh, goes to the end. But it, it switches in its significance. Yeah, Doctor Gain, there's a question in there. Yes. There, there were two several. questions. Okay. Yeah. All right. So one was on typology. Yes. And can you synthesize the, the second one? Um, this, on, on typology, the Cochian view, for yes, example. Yes, yes, I, I, I yeah. can answer that. And then <clears throat> um, I'm trying to think of the, this. All right, while you're thinking of that, yeah, let him think, answer okay, your so, first okay. question. Okay. Okay. So, so with regards to typology, 
Uh, you referenced Davis. Oh, yeah. D Davison. His, uh, Davidson's words in his definition, this, this synthesizes, that's why I actually highlighted this. Persons, events, and institutions, they're all nouns. They're all noun related in, in, in the way I understand it. And, and they're related to persons, events, or institutions. So the land of Israel is an institution. It's, you know, it's used synonymously with Israel itself. Um, events, things that happened. Um, that's, that's what I think type is most, like when we're looking at type, anti-type, that's where we're most uh, comfortable. That's, that's the ones he identifies. Because in Davidson's uh, thesis, what he does is he goes through and says there are different views on type anti-type. Some people limit it to only what the Bible specifically and literally identifies as a type anti-type relationship. And he says, well, no, 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 it's got to be more than that. It's got to be a hermeneutic that we could, we could go with and say, okay, we can identify other type anti-type relationships. And this is what he comes up with, which would mean that the verbal actions and the, the military language that you're talking about I wouldn't expect that to be, okay, it talks about um, a military thing, okay, that's a spiritual warfare. No, I wouldn't expect that because it's, that's not how type anti-type works. It's still, it's like this person is substituted, but it's going to do the same sort of work, the same sort of, like, so Elijah, Jeremiah was Elijah, he still, he did it, he had an evangelistic message, and, and then the end time Elijah is going to have an evangelistic message, it's not going to have, you know, do something completely different. It's, it, it's going to be some there's going to be differences and analogs. And so when we go to type anti-type, I would expect that the actions, the verbs and things like that would still be applying, you know, still be a, a military conflict, but just a, 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 a spiritual successor to the, to the uh, moniker of King of the North. Thank you. And then the second part really uh, pulls off what your answer is just now. If it's possible that in the anti-type there are details which are literal, could the land of Israel be one of those details? Not that it continues to be spiritually significant salvifically, but because it's significant to those players in that antitypical thing, like the papacy, has, has an address, and it fights with other people that have addresses. Okay, so the reason why I think that they're, they're one and the same, they're, they're used in a, in a synonymous, you know, the land and the people, is because if you look at the conflict in the first half, it's yes, it's, he said, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen with regards to your people, but it doesn't give all of the history of the Seleucids and all the history of the Ptolemies. It gives the history of their conflict over uh, the, the, the land of Syria, um, um, Koli Syria, which is that land of Israel. It, it's only focused on the people, the land of the people. So the land is the people and the people are the land. And so when the people change, it's, it's, it, the land is really the, the spiritual land. And it doesn't actually use the, um, like in the last verse, it's, it's using a temple word. It's, it's using the, the, the beautiful holy mountain, which is the location. It's, why was it significant? It was significant because of the location of the temple. We're talking about something that is going to stand in between the sea and the, the masses and the holy, glorious holy mountain, something that's going to try and obscure the intercessory ministry at the very end. That's, that's how I see that. Okay, so we have four minutes left, and we have three people who want to take a comment. Uh, one, and then Brother Nunez, and then... All right, yourself. Okay, so we, we have four minutes left, so can we just have a question or a brief comment, okay? Thank you. Yeah, um... More than once, you alluded to Daniel 9.24 with the six items. You, oh, yeah. you referred to that in a negative tone with regard to the Jews. Um, I don't know if you're aware of it, but by and large, our church has moved to a more positive view that it is Christ who is accomplishing all six of those rather than the Jews being uh, scolded and told that they had to somehow do those. Uh, for example, um, we're probably all familiar with Dr. Dukan. You know, in his, in his book here, Secrets of Daniel, he, he points out that Christians have been looking at this text in a negative way towards the Jews, when in fact there's nothing else in the text that would suggest that. And then you've got Dr. Maxwell who comes along and he says that the cutoff refers to the period of time, whereas so often we've taken this cutoff as the people being cut off. And so when you take both of those and then you look at our adult lessons, in our adult Sabbath school lesson of 87, hmm. it had an anti-Jewish sentiment in, in that part of the description. When you come to our newer Sabbath school lesson, uh, 2004, now it puts the focus totally positive on what Jesus accomplished there. 
and I'm going really fast for you here. Yeah. And then finally, somebody who you would appreciate from across the waters there in Australia, uh, Dr. Roy Allen Anderson, he had also come out in his work, point out that this was all that the Lord would accomplish. And we have a number of others such as uh, Dr. Lloyd Jones and, um, and, and others who also. So just something, it doesn't take away I, I anything. I agree with both. Like I, I see both. In my paper, I say that Jesus accomplished all those things on behalf of Israel. But the, the, the syntax is 70 weeks are cut off, yes, from the, from the period of time, but they're cut off for your people to do these things. Was I before you? Someone was before me, I think. He was. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you're saying in a promissory sense rather than in a conditional sense? Can you still see a period of probation there, though? There is see, probation, okay, yeah. I, I see it. I see it as both. I see it as all, all together. All right. Thank you. Uh, we have two questions left, and we have two minutes left. So, brother, your name? Martin Pröbstle. Oh, I'm welcome. From Austria. Yes. And uh, I, I will keep to the questions. So, my first question would be about typology. If I understand correctly, you use uh, a typological interpretation for Daniel 11, which for means... For the second half. For the second half. Uh -huh. uh, so far, I understood uh, typology in the sense, like I think Dr. Davidson understands it, that one single text might have a typological and plus an anti-typological interpretation. And uh, I, I haven't seen that now you doing for the second half of Daniel, that it has two. What is the typology no. and what is the anti-typology there? I see that the first half is typolog typolog typological. So Daniel's people are the typological Israel. King of the North is typological Seleucids. King of the South is ty typological Ptolemies. By the second half, you've got anti-typical entities fulfilling those same Okay, I understand that you do that. I wouldn't call that typological interpretation, by the way, because uh, it should be the same text, which has two, a typological historical fulfillment and an anti-typological steigerungs, or how is it called, escalated fulfillment. It's mm -hmm. the same text. So in, in biblical theology and exegesis, I think we would use another term. It's more okay. like like you said, the representative, spiritual explanation, yep. Christological, uh, that helps because if you say it's typological, I think people will think differently about it. The reason the I use typology is because of the accelerated sense. If you have a look at the, the accomplishments of the King of the North yeah. in the second half, yeah. they're greater than the accomplishments of the King of the North in the first half. Yeah. He actually fulfills every, all of the ambitions of the typical, anti the typical King of the North. And in my paper, I do have a table that shows that Antiochus III and his accomplishments are mag like expanded upon by the, the, last, the, the King of the North in the last six verses. Okay. Just wanted to be clear what's coming up in the mind of the reader. If okay, I hear yep. that, I think Daniel 11 Thanks has two applications mm -hmm. in all of the texts. Yep. And if that is not the case, I would use a different term. Uh, another term I stumbled on is intertextuality. I think you mean textual relations, because intertextuality, I think, is misused, maybe even misused a lot in the Adventist church. Okay. Intertextuality means not textual relations, but that texts are changed in another okay. text. So if you're a little bit more precise here, I can follow a little bit better. Thanks. Maybe, uh, Dr. Probstall, we could argue that... Intertextual is good, but intertextual would not fit. Maybe yeah. would a better description that, uh, to echo what uh, is being shared here, is that the first half of Daniel 11 may be an internal, was it analepsis, pointing forward to something happening later in the passage? Uh, th then I would say, well, what would be the relation between the first part and the second part? Is that just only uh, one entity, mm -hmm. or are there also the wars related mm -hmm. to the second part? Yes. Do you see more than that? Yes. 
Okay. Otherwise, it's just a shift. I, I agree with the shift in the Prince of the Covenant verse. There's definitely a shift there. But how do you explain it? Okay. And if you use typology, then you come to Matthew 24, where people use that. And I think Matthew 24 might not be the paradigm for Daniel 11. Mm -hmm. Just want to be careful okay. there. Okay. okay, thank you. And on Daniel 8, 9, we'll talk. Okay. Because right. uh, the, yes. the grammar there is not the reason why it's coming from the wind. Okay. But okay. And uh, final comment. Oh, okay. Brother Tassi? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I just had a clarification question, but I, I agree with Martin that maybe the the word typology might not be the best for explaining. I'm open for view. a better one. Um, but I do like the Christological approach. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think there's typology in there in the sense that, you know, once the seventy weeks are completed, then yes, then the church becomes the antitypical fulfillment of. God's Old Testament people. The clarification I have is because the Prince of the Covenant doesn't uh, die until verse 22, mm -hmm. but Rome is introduced in verse 20, and the typological fulfillment of God's people being the church rather than ancient Israel can't take place until verse 23. So therefore, I'm just, just there's clarification. Hmm. Uh, you would, uh, would you allow for the fact that Rome, beginning verse 20, is not typological. The, that's not the reason why Rome is introduced here. But the typology has to do more with I who God's people are. From a grammatical perspective, because of my emphasis on the word pivot, you know, having one foot that starts there, I think Rome being introduced beforehand shows that there was a literal like at the, during the time that it was literal, up to the verse 22, it had already transitioned from the Seleucids to Rome before, so we've already got a, a very good anchor point before it goes to the, to the next part of the chapter, the next half of the chapter, where Rome has started out as literal in his place, in his place shall arise. And I, I think that's the, the reason why it, it comes in, Rome comes in before it goes to the switch, otherwise there'd be a lot of uh, questions about who it's going to be, who, who is this new person, because now all the pronouns can still be referring to that. But we've also got Rome, uh, the way I see it in chapter 8, there is two phases, you know, there's the horizontal, there's the vertical, some say, there's the pa pagan and there's the papal phase of Rome. The pagan phases would be the typical phase, and then, like, uh, for lack of a better word at the moment, the pagan phase would be the typical, and then the papal phase would be the anti-typical. So you've still got the, the type anti-type of the same power. All right. Uh, it's been a great conversation. Um, I've been blessed by this morning. Have you? Yes. Um, it's really kind of got my, my gray matters kind of stirring this morning. It's been challenged. Um, the Village Church team have prepared a wonderful lunch for us here now. Um, why don't we uh, bow our heads and thank God for this morning and for the food, and we will gather back at 1.30 for a season of prayer, and then we will continue with our presentations this afternoon.